Welcome to the worship service of the Cashmere Gardens Church of Christ, 4315 Lippenwell Street, Houston, Texas, ministered by Brother Winfrey Frazier. It is our pleasure to have you with us on today. Together we will sing praises to God, lift up prayers, read from the Word of God, hear a gospel sermon, have an opportunity to give back to God, and observe the Lord's Supper. Let's now enter into worship. And I got to tell you, Brother Frazier is the kind of preacher that I can't stand. <laughs> I can't stand them preachers that can sing <laughs> and also preach. It'd be yeah. different if yeah. he couldn't do one of them. I wouldn't, I, I would like them, but he can do both of them. And I, the Lord didn't give me that gift of singing. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him why he didn't give me that gift. <laughs> Nevertheless, you all have a preacher that is worthy of your service. He's worthy of your following. God bless you, Brother Frazier. And then I have my wife with me, my baby mama, my side piece, my first lady, my only lady. As I tell everybody, she's the stripes in my peppermint. Sister Robin Johnson. Baby, wave your hand so the people can see you. Wave your hand, wave your hand. And we have our two beautiful children here, Jordan Johnson, who's 11, and Jada, who is two going on three. Lord, say the same should be three in August. Somebody say, preacher, how you get that big age gap? COVID. <laughs> At home all day, couldn't go nowhere. So we just got to looking at each other and knowing one another. And the Lord saw fit to give us a second child. God know God has a sense of humor. Because eight years we were enjoying our one child and we just thought that now nah, I guess everything is over with. And COVID came and COVID came and gave us an actual COVID baby. So y'all pray for us as well. Amen. As it has been mentioned, I am Brother Gerald Johnson, assistant minister to the North Wayside Church of Christ, where I serve under the leadership of our man servant, Brother Paul Jones. Brother Paul Jones is what we call semi-retired now. So y'all pray for, continue to keep Brother Paul Jones in your prayers. Amen. Then we have another gospel preacher here as well. Uh, brother Joe, I forget your last name, brother. Brother Joe Taylor, brother Joe Taylor. Good to see you, my brother. God bless you. Now then, y'all, I won't be long, but I will be strong. Meet me at the book of Genesis. Genesis, the 32nd chapter, beginning at verse number 22. Genesis 32, beginning at verse number 22. Want to give a round of applause for our young people as well for the way that they rendered service today. Our young people need to be encouraged. They need to be encouraged because truth be told, I don't know if you notice now, but the church is suffering from a lack of young people. It's not a church of Christ thing. It's a church thing across the board. So when you have young men that Think it not robbery to come out and worship God and also serve God. They also need to be encouraged as well. Let's give them a round of applause again. Genesis 32. Beginning at verse number 22. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. The Bible records these words. And when he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok, he took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. 
and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you need to know my name? And he blessed them there. So Jacob called the name of the place Penuel, for he said, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat muscle that shrink which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. If you don't mind, meet me at verse number 31, and this will be why our sermonic presentation will take fold. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on his hip, and he limped on his hip. Is that not in your Bibles? I want to tag the text this morning, living with a limp, living with the limp. In Japanese art, there's a Japanese pottery, a form of pottery rather, called kintsuji. Everybody say kintsuji. Kintsuji, what goes on in the art form of kintsuji is the potter he takes a large vessel that has been destroyed and he somehow, some way, makes the vessel more precious, more expensive, and in some cases, priceless. The term kintsuji means golden image, injury. And these vases are broken and put back together again, hit me cashmere, by a master potter. They are not simply just glued together, Brother Taylor. The potter repairs it with fine gold, with fine silver or platinum to form together an injury and shows that the vessel has been broken, but its beauty comes from its breakage. Its beauty comes from its imperfections and the potter wants to show us that these imperfections are something to celebrate and not something to hide. But I'm convinced, beloved, on this morning that a lot of us are trying to hide our imperfections. Not only are we trying to hide our imperfections, we are running from our imperfections. Rather than being honest with ourselves and realize that the church is comprised of nothing but a bunch of broken people. But here is the good news. Just as that potter pours gold or platinum or fine silver in the injuries of that, go of that broken vessel, God pours his mercy through the cracks in your lives and he beauties it to your brokenness. And in keeping up with the text, God sometimes has to break you himself to add meaning to the brokenness in your life. You know, life has a way of putting pain on repeat. Amen. But I submit to you today Amen. that if you learn to see the God in everything, young people, none of your pain will ever be wasted. Amen. Here, here's the words of an old story today of an old character who goes by the name of Jacob. Jacob has a what we call a peculiar personality. Jacob is the son of Isaac, which makes him the grandson of Abraham. And as a matter of fact, the conflict in Israel today stems to father Abraham. Let me set this up and then we'll get into a little preaching, if you will. But just be patient with me as we set this up. Abraham is what we call a superstar. 
There's even a song that you probably sung in VBS detailing just how popular Abraham is. Father Abraham has many sons. Y'all know the song. Don't sit there and look at me funny. Has many sons as Father Abraham. I'm one of them and so are you and let's just sing along. But Jacob's father seems less interesting. He seems less idolized and some would even say that Jacob's father is boring. Jacob's father goes by the name of Isaac. And you have to ask yourself, how does such a superstar, daring, debonair father produce such a boring son? You see on the pages of scripture, nothing about Isaac's life excites us. And I wonder if Isaac is walking around carrying a bit of trauma after almost having been sacrificed. Wouldn't you have some distance between you and God if you if your daddy laid you on the altar, raised the knife over your head and you realized you were about to be sacrificed? And it seems as if Isaac retreats, if you will. But this boring man does not marry a boring woman. He marries the complete opposite. He marries a woman by the name of Rebecca. And scholars and theologians believe that Rebecca is just as polarizing as Abraham. As faith would have it, Rebecca gets pregnant by Isaac. And Rebecca is wondering what's going on in her womb. God visits her and tells her she's pregnant, not with two boys, but with two nations. And the nations are warring in the womb. Help me, sisters. Because you know birth pains are enough. Having a child zap you of your energy is enough. But having two of them jokers wrestling on the inside of you, that's a different ball game. And God then visits her and he says to her, the eldest is going to serve the youngest and the youngest is going to rule over the oldest. And quite like a good mama, she can't help herself she tries to help God make what God had already promised her. So you get the feeling that Jacob becomes the center of his mother's world. But let me pause and put a quarter in the parking meter right here to remind you, Cashmere Garden, those of you parents who are guilty of parental favoritism, parental favoritism will cause your children to be enemies and not allies. And what parental favoritism does, it causes the child who feels less love to always seek validation. And if you grew up in a home as that child that is always seeking validation, let me try to free you this morning and remind you that validation is for parking and not for people. So here we see Jacob as he grows up. He thinks he's the center of the world because after all, his mother made him the center of her world. This kind of parenting strategy does not work, y'all. And when we meet Jacob in scripture, he's a man on the run. He comes running out of the womb, holding on to his brother's heel as if to say, I can't believe you beat me out of this womb. He's on the run tricking his father into stealing his birthright. He's then on the run fleeing from Esau who has pledged to kill him. He's then on the run trying to find a beautiful woman, yet he gets tricked himself and he marries the less attractive one. He's on the run again trying to marry this beautiful woman. He's on the run from his uncle Laban. Jacob is a man that's on the run. He's on the run. He's on the run. But let me pause and say a word to you. Those of you who are on the run. Some of us, we don't slow down long enough to realize how good God is. Some of us don't slow down long enough. We're always chasing money, always chasing a bag on the run to another city, on the run chasing a dream. 
You are on the run chasing opportunities. You're on the run chasing your next goal. You are so much on the run, you have not even slowed down long enough to realize who you are in Christ Jesus. But let me help you. If you're on the run all the time, I need to remind you that if you rush it, you will also ruin it as well. You are so much on the run, you haven't paid attention to who you are, beloved. And hear me, moving fast is not the same as going somewhere. And beloved, this is something that I'm working on in my life. Because many of us young men, we're always on the go. But here it is, young man, I'm starting to learn that God wants more for you than you can ever want for yourself. You just got to trust him to get it his way. And every day God shows us he wants more for us. We just need to trust him to get it his way. When you trust him to get it his way, you don't have to plot to get it. When you trust him to get it his way, young lady, you don't have to sleep around to get it. When you trust him to get it his way, you don't have to wear yourself out to get it. When you trust him to get it his way, you don't have to lie to get it. When you trust him to get it his way, you don't have to bully your way to get it. God wants more for you than you can ever want for yourself. And here you go. You see, Jacob, Jacob is used to getting things his way. But I want to paint this picture of Jacob. Can't you see Jacob? Has on a dark purple suit, blue polka dot uh, shirt, polka dot tie, nice fresh fade, smooth dark beard. I ain't talking about me, I'm talking about you. Can't you see, Jake? Because truth be told, beloved, a lot of us look at the story of Jacob but what God is showing us this morning that the lot, a lot of the characteristics that Jacob has, they are in you and I as well. Jacob is on the run after he tricked his uncle. And when we find him in the text, we find Jacob taking a nap between two burned bridges. And the last thing this, sieve, this deceiver wanted was a fight. Mm -hmm. He's been moving his family. Yeah. He's been moving his life. Mm -hmm. He's exhausted. He's emotionally fatigued. And he pauses to lay down in the midnight sky. Mm -hmm. He's alone with himself. Yeah. And in that moment, Brother Fraser, the mm -hmm. Bible says an unidentified person mm -hmm. picks him up and throws him down. Y'all looking at me like this is normal. Imagine you're sleeping in your bed and all of a sudden an unidentified person wakes you up, picks you up, and lay you down. What would you have said? I guarantee none of us would have been singing this harvest time. <laughs> Many of us would have said, what in the, uh-huh, what in the world? is going on in here do you know what would come out of your mouth beloved and hear me church jacob is alone by himself and i want you to understand that sometimes god will do the best work in your life when he gets you alone by yourself because many of us we feel like we haven't had the direction of the spirit of god in our lives because we live in this generation where we keep iPods in our ear. We keep headphones in our ear. We have more screen time than we have Bible time and prayer time. We're always on social media, always binge watching the television, always binge watching and listening to the latest podcast. But I need to remind you, God gets you by yourself, and when he does, sometimes life has to wear you out so you can hear from the word of God. Yeah. You will come to know yourself when God gets you by yourself. And as we look at this lesson that's entitled Living with the Limp, two things I want to give you, then the lesson will be yours. 
if you are going to live with the limp, it involves wrestling with God. And if you are going to survive with that limp, it involves clinging to God. Two points for you, then the lesson will be yours. Wrestling and clinging. When we get to Genesis 32, when you get to around verse number 23 through 34, uh, 22 through 23 rather, the Bible says, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him in the break of day. The original Hebrew language suggests that they were kicking up dust. But notice what Jacob does in the text. He starts to fight back. You would as well if somebody disturbed your life. As if Jacob is saying, you can't disturb my life and expect me not to fight back. Because Jacob wants to hold on to this unidentified man. And Jacob realizes that this unidentified man is stronger than him. He's mightier than him. And what he does, he simply holds on to him. Don't miss your shout, Cashmere. This is powerful because the only way you can fight against God is to hold on to God. You and I need to understand that God has worth something holding on to. I don't know about you, but I got my testimony of why I hold on to God. I hold on to God because he's able. I hold on to God because he is our creator. I hold on to him because he's my deliverer. He's my defender. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's faithful. He's forgiving. He's gentle. He's gracious. He's immortal. He's Jehovah. He's Lord of Lord. He's King of Kings. But matter of fact, he has a name that is above every name. Hold on to God, Cashmere, because he has something worth holding on to. Hold, he holding on, he holds on to him. And let me pause and say, God has been lingering in our life, but we don't hold on to him when he comes to visit us. Sometimes God comes to visit us and we push the devotion to the side. We close the Bible, we mute the sermon. God is knocking at the door of our heart and in our minds, but sometimes, beloved, our our affection is somewhere else. But this ain't no choreographed fight, y'all. Again, the Hebrew words suggest that they were kicking up dust. They were actually in a fight. And it was taking Jacob everything that was on the inside of him. It was taking Jacob everything that was on the inside of him because here it is. When you finally come in contact with God, it's going to take everything that you have as well. Because you can't keep God and keep your sin at the same time. You can't keep God and be a people pleaser at the same time. You can't keep God and keep wrestling with yourself at the same time. Hear me, y'all. Somebody is going to win outright, and the will of God is always stronger than your will. You know, we love to talk about how God fights against our haters. Mm -hmm. We love to talk about how God fights against the world. Mm -hmm. But I had to learn that it's three enemies in the world. Mm -hmm. There's the enemy around you. That's the world. There's an enemy below you. That's the devil. Mm -hmm. But y'all know who we fight with the most? Yeah. The enemy that's on the inside of you. Yeah. Sometimes your biggest enemy is your inner me. And here goes Jacob. He's fighting with himself. But I want us to understand that thanks be to God that he wrestles with us. Because in my 42 years of living, I've learned that there are some things that we wanted to do. Some things we could have done. But God kept us from it because he was wrestling with us. God is trying to, and God wrestles with you because he's trying to get some stuff out of you as much as he's trying to put some stuff on the inside of you. But verse 24, 
makes me scratch my head. Verse 24 says, Jacob and this man were wrestling until the break of day. The fact that this wrestling match lasted all night illustrates how determined the flesh is to have its own way. Jacob was in the fight of his life. And Jacob refused to give up or give in. Doesn't sin have a way of just keep hanging on to you, beloved? It refuses to give up. So to teach us to lose, God not only wrestles with us, watch this, he cripples us as well. Jacob didn't give up. So God dislocated his hip. And when you are wrestling with God, remember, y'all, God doesn't fight fair. Yes, he's good. Yes, he's holy. Yes, he's just. When I say God doesn't fight fair, I'm not saying God uses underhanded tactics. Here's what I'm saying. God will exercise his authority over your agenda and God refuses to lose. God cannot lose. So God will put your life out of joint. God will dislocate your plans. God will cripple you just to make you just like him. It involves wrestling. But y'all, it also involves clinging as well. Look at verse 25. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail, he touched the the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Jacob is saying, man, this is some kind of power. I've been in some fights all of my life, but this thing is stronger than me. The one he's fighting against is the one that is trying to break his spirit, not necessarily break his spirit, but break his habits, if you will. So he says, you got to let me go. Jacob says, no, I ain't going to let you go until you bless me. I tell this story all the time, y'all. My two-year-old daughter knows how to get her way. Brother Fraser, when it's time for me to go to work in the morning, I would give everybody a kiss, and i say, okay, daddy got to go. She would wrap her entire body around my leg. And i say, baby, daddy got to go to work. She said, no, you can't go. i say, Daddy got to go to work. She said, no, you can't go. I said, okay, what is it that you want from me? She says, I said, do you want me to stay home? She says, no. Said, do you want me to go talk to mama about something? She says, no. I said, what do you want? Do you want a dollar? She says, yes. She don't let me go until she gets her way. But hear me. That sounds humorous. But when was the last time we held on to God long enough just to get an answer from him, y'all? Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. This is personal to me, y'all. Because here I see Jacob saying, I didn't come this far with you, Lord, to leave out of here with nothing. I haven't been wrestling with you all night to leave out of here with nothing. I haven't been clinging to you because I want clarity. I cling to you because I trust you. Because, Brother Taylor, everything that I read about God in this book says he's a good God. Everything that I read about him says he's a true God. He's a just God. He's a kind God. And I cling to him because he's too kind to be mean. I cling to him because there's nobody like him, y'all. Let me go ahead and shout in here if you don't mind. When I say there's nobody like Jesus, I mean there's nobody like Jesus. 
Nobody spoke like Jesus. Nobody talked like Jesus. Nobody walked like Jesus. Nobody preached like Jesus. Nobody loved like Jesus. Nobody performed miracles like Jesus. Nobody died like Jesus. Nobody got up like Jesus. And ain't nobody coming back like Jesus. There's nobody like Jesus, y'all. Ain't no way, God, I've been walking with you this long. Going through all the Hades in the world. And you expect me to let you go. No, I'm not letting you go because I don't have nowhere else to go. I don't have nobody that will love me like you will love me. I don't have nobody that will forgive me like you can forgive me. I don't have nobody that can put me back together again like you can put me back together. Excuse me for a second, y'all, because when we're talking about living with the limp, I think about that old nursery rhyme that we used to sing as a kid. You remember that nursery rhyme that talked about Humpty Dumpty? Uh-huh. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. Can we spiritualize that for a second? Gerald Johnson sat on the wall. Gerald Johnson had a great fall. All the vices in the world couldn't put Gerald back together again, but glory be to God, Jesus put him back together again. And I cling to him because God is not out to destroy you. He's out to develop you. God is shaping you. He's molding you. He's protecting you so that one day you will be worth more broken than you all put together. So, Lord, if you got to break me, I want you to put me back together again. Lord, if the world breaks me. You put me back together again. No matter what goes on in the world, Lord, as long as you break me, I'm fine. But make sure you put me back together again. God broke Jacob down to the point where he even changed his name. He said, he said Jacob, what's your name? He said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He said, no, nah, uh-uh. Mm -mm, not no more. You didn't come in contact with me. So you can't leave out of here the same. Church folk don't know when to shout. Because there is no way you can come in contact with a God like this and remain the same for the rest of your life. He changed his name from Jacob to Israel. In a literal sense, the name Israel means God fights. Church folk don't know when to shout because you see he was fighting with God. But when God changed his name, he's no longer Jacob, he's Israel, and now God will fight for him. Yeah. We might be some bad you-know-what in this world, yeah. but can't nobody outbox God, y'all. Yeah. Changed his name from Jacob to Israel, but I'm so glad he changed my name. Changed my name from a liar to a truth teller, from a sinner to a saint, yeah. from a cheater yeah. to being faithful, yeah. from lukewarm to being on fire for yeah. the Lord, yeah. from strong to weak and relying on his power, yeah. from guilty to forgiving. Yeah. If I'm being honest, he changed me from a dope dealer to a hope dealer. Yeah. Ain't God good, y'all? Yeah. And he won. Jacob won this fight because now God will fight for him. Cash me as I get ready to close. Need to tell you about this story that I read about golf balls. Found out years ago. Well, let me tell you how I got the story. A couple of my frat brothers tried to get me to play golf. And I watched golf on television. And nothing about what I saw on television made me want to get out there and go play golf. 
So I said, I said, I said, hey man, how, how long are we gonna be out there? They said, oh man, we got nine holes. I said, does that mean we gotta put that ball in the hole nine times? They said, yeah, you right. I said, so hold on. You mean tell me we gotta hit the ball, get in the golf cart, drive to the ball, get out the golf cart, hit the ball again, get in the golf cart, drive again, Hit the ball again, and we got to do that till we get it in the cup nine times. Nah, I'm good. Y'all can have that, man. <laughs> Stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. As I was doing a little research on the game of golf, Brother Fraser, I found out that golf balls, when the game of golf was invented, the golf ball was smooth. So that was a man one day who used to be a groundskeeper for a golf course. He would just collect these dented golf balls. And one day, as he collects hundreds of dented golf balls, he said, I'm bored, I ain't got nothing else to do. Let me hit these golf balls. So he grabbed the smooth ball and he hit that ball. Boom, ball traveled far. And he said, these dented balls, they ain't worth nothing. Let me hit this one. Boom. And he noticed that dented ball flew further than that smooth ball. He said, something ain't right about this. This one got more dits in it. I know this one ain't about nothing. Put it down and boom. He said, my goodness. Look at that ball. Then he grabbed the ball and a hammer and a nail and started nailing more dents in the ball. And he put the ball down and he swung and the ball went so far the man couldn't even see it. Beloved, you and I, we came into this world smooth. Before we came to church, we were smooth. Before we came to Jesus, we were smooth. And we've been walking with the Lord a long time. And walking with the Lord, I'll be honest with you, you get some dents in your life. Can I be honest with you? Being a gospel preacher, you get some dents in your life. Because let me say this and I'll go on. A lot of times, beloved, preachers don't get grace in the church. Because there's grace from the pulpit, but there is no grace for the pulpit. That's another sermon within itself. So preachers get dented as they walk with Jesus. And I stopped by this morning to remind you that God has to dent us, not to destroy us, to develop us so we can go further. Y'all ain't saying nothing. In this thing called life, beloved. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the dents that I received in my life. I'm thankful for being bruised in my life. I'm thankful that God dented some things in my life, not to develop me, but not to destroy me, but to develop me so I can go farther with Christ Jesus in this thing called life, y'all. And you ought to be thankful as well for the dents in your life. They don't feel good, but God got some good out of it. How do you know and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. You're not dented just to be dented. You're dented so God can develop you. Oh, and let me say this. Sometimes God has to ditch you just so he can deliver you as well. And then when you see Jacob, Verse 31 says, he got up the next morning and he was limping on his hip. People look at that and they say, ah, God didn't have to give Jacob that limp, but here is grace. God could have killed him. Y'all don't know when to shout. Y'all don't know when to shout. Do you know? The thing that could have killed you is the thing God lets you survive just so you can get it right with him again, y'all. 
And let me be honest. The only reason why we come to church, because we know what it's like to be dented. The only reason we walk with God, because we know what it's like to be dented. But I thank God that the dents did not destroy me. They developed me, even if I got to walk with a limp. If I got to walk with a limp for the rest of my life, I'm going to limp my way on to heaven because when I get to heaven, the Bible says I get a new body, a new mind, a new spirit. But furthermore, I'm with Jesus for the rest of my life, beloved. There's somebody here this morning. You know what it's like to be dented. You know what it's like to have holes in your life. As one preacher would tell me, he said, Gerald, uh, I don't have, I got some holes in my life. I got holes in my life because I leak sometimes. But he says, glory be to God, he knows how to patch me back up every now and then. And the only way God can patch some of us up, beloved, is when we learn to come to him. How do we come to him, young brother? You've heard the word. Believe, repent, confess, and be baptized and give your life to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you this. Baptism has never got no one into trouble. But on the day of judgment, if you are baptized, baptism can get you out of trouble. Baptism is a wonderful thing, y'all. It connects you to Jesus Christ. Then it connects you to a body of believers as well. But one thing I love about baptism, it washes our sins away. Somebody needs to give their life to Christ this morning. Somebody needs to be baptized this morning. And if you are a child of God, remember, every dent you have in your life is not to destroy you. It's to develop you. And God, when he develops us, he's going to get some good things out of us so we can fly further in this thing called life. I've spoken to you long enough. If you're subject to the words of this lesson, we ask that you, you, that you respond to the Savior's invitation as we sing the song that has been numbered for us. You know I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And a little, little light from heaven filled my soul. Thank you for being with us today. 
Please contact us for a Bible answer to a Bible question, a prayer request, a call from the minister, communion supplies, how to give electronically, and our weekly schedule. Until the next time, may God bless you and keep you is our prayer.